Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text for the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost comes from our Gospel reading of Luke. Jesus said, And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth distress of nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. We all know it's true. Just look around you. Just turn on the news. Just log on to Twitter. It's as plain as plain can be. There are wars all around us. Well, maybe not all around us, but all over the globe. And it seems as if it's just as real and as if it's just happening in our own backyard after seeing all those pictures on the screen. That is, of course, until we flip on over to the next thing on our phone or when that new job is a hassle and the kids have the flu. And we can't be bothered to pay any more attention to something that's happening a world away. But I do suppose that that world away could very well be the world right in front of us if the wrong person does the wrong thing with the wrong weapon. So yes, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. But maybe it's not wars or rumors of wars that get you all knotted up with anxiety. Maybe it's the way in which the earth just might seem to be sputtering out its last gasps of life. There are some out there who say that we have less than 20 years to stop that existential crisis of catastrophic collapse. And whether you believe that the weather will destroy us, and I offer no stance on that this morning, it is certainly clear that there are hurricanes and droughts and flooding and volcanoes and all that's happening all around us. And these things affect real people, even if they aren't affecting us right now. These things bring real suffering and sometimes even real death. And although we would like to be in control of all of these things, like to think that if society got its act together, we could stop some of them, the truth is Mother Nature is a mother too big for us to cram inside a box. She's going to do what she's going to do, and we're just going to have to strap in for the ride. The moon is broken, the sky is cracked, and there isn't a darn thing that we can do about it. Yes, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. But hey, maybe wars and rumors of wars and climate change and polar ice caps aren't your bag. Maybe you've been glued to the politics of this country, of this state, of your neighborhood. And hey, maybe, just maybe, the elections all went your way and you're rejoicing over another two years of victory. Or maybe they didn't and you're lamenting the foreseeable future and all the worries that have in store for you. Tell the truth, this morning I don't really care which camp you're in. Because each side of the aisle, each camp has, had, has been in the same boat, just at different times. Each side has been convinced, within the last decade at least, and probably throughout all of our nation's history, that our country is going to crumble and we aren't going to wake up in our grandfather's America tomorrow. And what in the world is little old you going to do about it? How are you going to be able to stop the avalanche that's been started? You aren't. And so you're convinced that the best that you can hope for is that you don't get buried too deep so that you can't dig yourself out after it's all said and done. The fact of the matter is, we all play the part of Chicken Little. We've all been convinced at some point that the sky is falling all around us and there's nothing that we can do about it. And in a sense, we've all been right. Except, of course, that history has a pretty good track record of seeing the sun come up the next day and life continuing on its way. 
Now, that isn't to say that the world won't stop spinning one day. It most certainly will. That is the promise of our Lord. But the Christian should have a different perspective on it than everyone else. Jesus talks about all of these things and many more things in our gospel text for today. Now, Luke, he lays it out a little bit different than the other gospel writers, but it's no less stark. In the 21st chapter of Luke, Jesus spins for us a tale of destruction and total demise of the earth. But the way in which he does it is kind of interesting because Jesus, I don't know if you realized it or caught it, but he weaves his way from the near future to the mid future to the far future of the last and final day. And then he goes and he does it all over again. Sometimes you can't tell when he's actually talking about He seamlessly takes us from the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem. That does happen in 70 AD to the ever-present time of the earth groaning and spitting out natural disasters. And then he has us look up into the heavens to watch the sun and the moon and the stars do strange things that don't make any sense. And then he casts our gaze back to the nations of this world as tyrants and kings play a real-life game of risk leaving death and bloodshed in their wake. All of this is bound to happen. Our Lord says so. So don't be surprised when it does. And so then, maybe the Christian shouldn't be all that concerned with these things. All of these things that are so far above our pay grade. Now that certainly doesn't mean that we shouldn't throw soda cans in the recycling bin instead of the trash can, or that we shouldn't be on school boards or run for public office or vote in our elections in order to affect some sort of change in our small little slice here on earth. But it does mean that we shouldn't be so pompous as to think that if we can just pull the right lever, everything's going to be okay. Maybe it will. Probably it won't. But that's hardly the issue at hand. And the Christian shouldn't be overwhelmed at the fullness of this brutal little world of ours. And I know that's a lot easier said than done. But we haven't been given the job to save the planet. It isn't ours to save. All the Christian has been given to do is to be good stewards of it. That and to fulfill the vocations that our Lord has given us to do. If the world is crashing all around you, don't despair that it's a problem too big for you to fix. Instead, look at the stations in your life. Are you a mother? Then good. Take care of your children. Are you a father? Good. Provide shelter and protection for your family and lead them in the ways of the Lord. Are you a worker or a boss or a student or a retiree? Fine. Good. Do all of the good works that are given to those vocations and do them in order to serve your neighbor, the one that the Lord has set before you. The world is going to come to an end someday. Maybe you'll see it. Maybe you won't. But that doesn't give you license to forget the neighbors the Lord has placed in front of you. And another point to be made from this text is that we shouldn't use it to try and predict the future. Every generation before us, since the time of the apostles until now, had the thought that its generation was the last, that the Lord was surely going to come before they tasted death. But again, none of them lived to see that day. And perhaps, maybe, that's just why Jesus doesn't give us any specific examples of future events to look forward to in regard to the last and final day. And yes, I know, he did speak specifically about the temple and Jerusalem herself crumbling down. But besides that, everything else that he talked about, all of the wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and blood moons and all of that, all of those things have happened in every single generation. 
Don't worry your pretty little head about knowing the day or the hour. That isn't for you to know. Instead, like somebody in our LWML Bible study said yesterday, the Christian should live each day as if it is his first, and each day as if it is his last. For what our Lord is most concerned about is that the Christian is prepared for the day in which he comes again in glory. And all that really means is that the Christian busies himself with the things of Jesus. That is, the Christian makes sure that he and his family are where Christ has promised to be. Receive the good and gracious gifts that your Lord pours out for you here in this place and receive them often, which is to say, receive them always, which is to say, receive them continually as if they are the foundation of your very life because they are. Hardly any individual has control over the big and momentous things that happen in this world. Hurricanes will hit. Wars will be fought. Kings will come and kings will go. But 99.9% of people will never have a say whether any of those things happen or don't. But the individual Christian does have a say in whether or not he and his family will be ready when the Lord comes again. I know that might seem daunting. But the Lord does make it pretty simple and easy for us in this regard. Is the forgiveness of sins going to be proclaimed? Good. Be where you can hear it. Is Christ going to give his body and blood as a foretaste of the feast to come? Good. Be where you can partake of it. Is the Lord of the church going to gather together his people so that they can encourage each other and help each other and pray for each other and laugh and cry and rejoice and mourn with each other? Good. Be where the mutual consolation of the saints takes place so that all of these things can be yours. Because yes, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. It must. It's fallen, and it's broken, and it's full of sin. It must die. There's no other way. Kind of like us. And our Lord has said as much. But our Lord also provides for us, in this fallen and broken world, everything that we need to support this body and life. And we receive all of these good things with thanksgiving and praise, knowing that there will be a day in which we will want for nothing. Not a thing will be lacking. Because for the Christian, the last and final day is not a day that should be feared. It is not a day in which we will have to run screaming for the hills. Instead, to paraphrase Samwise Gamgee in The Return of the King, that day will be a day in which everything sad will come untrue. And it will somehow be better for once being broken and lost. The end of the church year of which we are in right now, with only two more Sundays until Advent, is the time in which the church takes a look at the promise of the last day. Is that day today? Maybe. There's no way of knowing. But then again, it might not be in any of our lifetimes. It might not be for another 2,000 years. Now we pray that it isn't that far away. We pray that our Lord comes quickly comes even before I finish this sermon because it's been droning on for far too long. (laughs) But if it doesn't, the Christian's fine with that. As the Apostle Paul says, it would be far better if we were with the Lord. But until that day, we live in the promises of our Lord. And so what if the world is going to hell in a handbasket? Did Christ still die on the cross in order to forgive you all of your sins? 
Did Christ still descend into hell to proclaim to the demons that the victory is his and therefore it is yours? Did Christ still burst forth from the grave, sealing death, your death, inside that tomb? Is Christ right now ascended at the right hand of the Father with all things placed under his feet? Does Christ still give his cross and his resurrection, his very self, to you this day in a word preached and forgiveness proclaimed and baptismal washing and a foretaste of the eternal feast in heaven? Well then, good. Receive Christ now in the fallenness of this broken world so that you can be assured that you will receive him fully on the day in which he makes all of the sad things untrue. And you get to live with him for eternity in a world, new heavens and new earth, free from sin and death and the powers of evil. Dear Christians, have no fear. Your redemption is drawing near. In the name of Jesus.